How are we doing today, guys? Good. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. I was on a TOTUS 2 team back in 2015. Hard to believe that that was three years ago. So I'm super excited to be here with all you guys. And uh, if you're open to it, I'd love to start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, I ask that uh, you descend down upon each one of these young men and women who had the courage to walk away from other exciting things they could have done this summer to share and be a witness for young adults in the Diocese of Peoria and Gary. Lord, I ask that whatever you wish to share for, to them, that you may use me as your instrument. That may not be me who speaks, but you who speak through me. And we offer this and all the intentions in our heart to our Blessed Mother as we pray. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight, you have an opportunity to encounter Christ in a profound way, for adoration and confession. And if you were like me growing up, you struggled to understand, well, why does the Eucharist matter? How is Jesus really there in the bread? How can God really forgive my sins in the sacrament of confession? So what I want to share with you are some of the things that I've learned and the things that convicted me, how God is truly present in the Eucharist and how God truly sets us free in confession. If you have a Bible with you, I'd ask you to turn to John chapter 6. If you don't, no worries, I'll read with you guys. And we're turning to John chapter 6. We're going to pick it up at verse 25. To give you some background on where we're picking up the story, this happens right after Jesus has multiplied the loaves of bread for the 5,000 people. After that, Jesus and the apostles, they leave to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The people come searching for Christ, and we pick up the story where they found him. In verse 25, the people say to Jesus, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered and said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God has set his seal. So the people are getting pretty excited. Man, bread that makes me live forever. So they ask him, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one that he sent. So they said to him, well, what, what sign can you show us? Our ancestors, they, they ate manna in the desert. And Jesus replies to them, amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven, my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. My fa for the bread that, excuse me, for the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The Jews are pretty excited. So they tell him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, Whoever believes in me will never first. Jesus continues to emphasize this point. And the Jews, they start questioning each other. I mean, does, does he really mean this? Isn't, it, isn't this guy Joseph the carpenter's son? Jesus hears them and he responds. And we should keep in mind that whenever Jesus responds to the Jews when they're confused, he does one of two things. He either emphasizes the point again, making it clear to the Jews he meant what he said the first time, or he explains it another way. In verse 41, Jesus replies again, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. Or excuse me, that's in verse 47. Your ancestors, they ate manna in the desert, but they died. But this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. He's now said he's the bread of life three times. 
And the Jews, they aren't just questioning anymore. They're starting to argue amongst themselves. How can he give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus continues, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Jesus has said he's the bread of life three times. And he follows it up by saying that you must eat my flesh and drink my blood four times. He's making it very clear to the Jews what he means here. Well, what's their response? In verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus started that day with thousands of people following him. He ended the day with just 12. And I want you to think about that for a second. How can Jesus accomplish his plan for salvation if no one follows him? If everyone walked away from him that day, who would be left to share the good news, to build his church? Jesus was willing to let thousands walk away from him. He was willing to risk the plan for salvation because that is how important the Eucharist is to our salvation. Because the thing about God, He desires to get rid of any obstacle that comes between us and Him. We believe that we have a God who is all-knowing. We could pray to Him right now and He will hear us and respond. But He knows that we have senses too. We have eyes to see, ears to hear, a mouth to speak. And He desires to relate to us on that level. That's why He desires to become present to us in the Eucharist, physically present. So there's no, nothing in between us and him. And he was willing to stake thousands of people walking away from him on that. Well, what did the apostles think of this? In 67, Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, do you also want to leave? And Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. Peter, the first Pope of the church, the one who Jesus said, you are my rock and on this rock I will build my church. He didn't understand how the Eucharist worked. He didn't go on the board and write a math equation to figure it out. He, he accepted it on an act of faith. He considered what his life was like before Christ and after. And he knew his life was a lot better with Christ than without him. He didn't fully understand the Eucharist, but he was willing to trust Christ on this point. And that's what Jesus asks of us in the Eucharist. We may not fully understand it, but Jesus makes it very clear that he's serious here. And like the apostles, those who choose to follow him will learn that life with Christ is so much better than without it. That's why he gave us the Eucharist. I still, after I realized that, I struggled with understanding why does he come to us as bread though? Why doesn't God come in his almighty power? But think about what Jesus did this day after he multiplied the 5,000 loaves. Most of those people weren't there to get to know Christ. They were there for another miracle. They were there to get fed. They didn't care about getting to know Jesus. That's why he comes to us simply in bread instead of revealing his glory. He wants to get rid of anything that distracts us from being in a relationship with him. Jesus isn't about the cheap frills. He isn't about an exciting thing every now and then. He is about a relationship through the good and through the bad. He comes to us simply to get rid of the distractions. He comes to us simply because something like bread, whether you are the poorest of the poor, the rich of the wrist, rich of the rich, it's something that you have access to. God comes to us in the appearance of bread, something that everyone, no matter what your background is, you can find it so that everyone can come to Christ. 
Jesus Christ wants to remove everything that gets between us and him. God desires to be present to you in adoration. He is truly present there. The question is, are you going to be truly present to him? And I understand that's hard. I really struggled with what to do with myself in prayer. If you brought a rosary and desire to spend time praying that, great, go for it. If you brought your Bible or brought a favorite religious book, feel free to read that. But I want to challenge you to do something tonight. I want to challenge you to rest in the silence because that's where God speaks to us. In the Old Testament, Elijah the prophet, when he wanted to pray, he would, he would go away from the cities, he'd go up into the mountains. One time when he was there, a great storm came through the mountain range and he thought, surely this is the voice of God. Storm passes, he doesn't hear God. That fall, God follows that up with an earthquake coming through the valley. And Elijah says, well, surely God is gonna to speak to me in this. He doesn't hear God's voice. And one incredible thing after another happens, but it's only after all that passes away that Elijah hears God in a calm, quiet voice. We have to get comfortable being in the silence because it's the only way that God speaks to us. And I understand it's challenging. We are surrounded and bombarded by noise everywhere in our life. So what I invite you guys to do I'm going to show you and share with you an exercise that I do to enter into prayer. I would ask that if you sit up straight, keep your arms relaxed. If you want to put your hands on the desk or in your lap, whatever feels comfortable. And I ask that you close your eyes. I want you to take a deep breath in and take a deep breath out. Deep breath in and out. As you take the deep breath in, I want you to think of the name Jesus. And as you take that deep breath out, I want you to think of the word love. As you listen, maybe you can hear the, the hum of the air conditioning. I want you to listen past that, past the background noise, because that's where you will hear God speaking to you. And there is so much that he wants to tell you. You can open up your eyes now. The first time I did that, it felt really uncomfortable. So if that's how you felt, that's perfectly fine. But the more we enter into prayer, the better we get at it, just like playing a sport. You might struggle at first, but if you persevere in it, you get better at it and you feel more comfortable with it. So I challenge you tonight, spend some time listening to our Lord. And I want you to share what's on your heart with him. Whatever it is, good and the bad, but once you do that, give him a chance to reaffirm you, to tell you how much he loves you, to guide you on the plan that he has for you. I know for my life, my life would look, so, would, 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 would look a lot different if it wasn't for coming to our Lord in adoration. Those who know me know I'm an avid runner, but that probably wouldn't be the case if it wasn't for adoration. I was incredibly injury prone. There was talk at one point about having to put an iron rod in my leg because of how messed up I was. My teammates gave up on me, my coaches gave up on me, my parents told me to stop, I gave up on myself. The last thing holding me back from telling my coach I was gonna quit was going to adoration. And every time I wanted to quit, God told me, give it another week, give it another week. I didn't think it would make a difference, but I took his word for it. And I'm so grateful looking back on that because running was the one constructive thing, keeping me from falling into a lot of sinful habits. Running was where all my friends were, and if I had lost that, I would have been completely lost. God guided me to where I needed to be, and he will do the same for you if you are willing to listen. Adoration is only part of the story, though. God has done everything he possibly can to be present with us. But I think we know what the other half of the story is. We run away. We abuse the gifts he's given us. 
We mock the freedom he has given us. We ignore him. We reject him. And God's justice demands there is a consequence for our sins. And the consequence is death. But God is also a merciful God. He doesn't want that to be the end. But he's a God of justice. He's also a God of mercy. If he shows us mercy, then where's the consequence? But if he judges us, how can he save us? He took the hit himself. God became man and died on the cross as a criminal. The punishment meant for us. So that by fulfilling justice, he can show us mercy. Because what sin does in our lives, it creates this infinite chasm. God is on one side, we are on the other. We cannot cross it on our own. But what the cross of Christ did is it is the bridge that allows us to come back to God. The only question is, are we going to accept the gift or are we going to reject it? God's already given it to us. You know, I think um, an example of this, I was watching the movie Saving Private Ryan recently. If you don't know the premise of it, a young mother during World War II has four sons serving abroad. One day she receives three letters that three of her sons were killed in action on the same day. And her fourth son is missing in action in Normandy. So the generals, they assign eight army rangers to find Private Ryan and bring him back home. Many of them don't come back. Some of them die before they even find him. And when they do, they're behind enemy lines, surrounded, outnumbered, outgunned, desperately trying to hold on until reinforcements can come. By the end of the movie, six of those eight men are dead. Most of Ryan's squad is dead as well. Ryan is kneeling next to Captain Miller, one of the men tasked with saving him. And his last words to Miller are, earn this. Earn this. Captain Miller was asking Ryan to live in honor for those who had passed. And really, there's nothing Private Ryan could do to earn what had happened. There's nothing he could do to deserve those men laying down his life, their lives, so that he could live. All he can do is choose to accept their sacrifice that allowed him to live and live his life accordingly, or he can reject it and waste the sacrifice. We have the same choice. We didn't deserve what Christ did on the cross. We did nothing to earn it. We can't do anything to earn it. But God has given it to us anyways. And I know it's hard to see that. We live in a broken world that hurts us. It beats us down. It makes us give up on ourselves. It makes us give up on the thought that we can be redeemable. I get that firsthand. I had a hard time trusting people growing up. I had a hard time trusting my family, my friends, my teachers. So I turned to a lot of sins to try and get away from it. I turned to lust to try and numb it. I turned to greed to try and prove I, I mattered. I would cut down other people just to feel good about myself. And I never felt good about myself. That's what broken humanity does to us. But Jesus changes the story. A great example is the prodigal son. Father Hebner shared that with you a little, a little earlier. That story was a lot different during the time of Christ. It was a popular story that the rabbis would share as a teaching lesson. How the story ended before Christ told it? Son would tell his father, I wish you were dead. Give me your inheritance. He'd waste it on all kinds of sinful things. Hit rock bottom, come back. He's on his knees begging to his father. Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. The father reaches behind him, grabs a bunch of pig slop and slaps it on his feet. And he says, that's what you are to me. Go away and don't come back. That's how broken humanity looks at God's mercy. But Jesus changes the story. Instead of no hope, instead of no redemption, now when the son comes back, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven, he doesn't even get out everything he's trying to say. The father hugs him. He's yelling to the servants, slaughter the fan calf, throw a party. My son was dead and he is back to life. That is what God does when we come to confession. Confession isn't to beat us up. It isn't to make us feel bad. It isn't to make us feel like we aren't good enough. Confession is there so God can free us of everything that holds us back from being our best. So that 
confession is where God wants to show us how he sees us. Because when he looks at you, he doesn't see a failure. He doesn't see a mess up. He doesn't see someone who's not good enough. When he looks at you, what he sees is someone who's worth dying for. And I hope that every time that you look at a cross, you realize that he did that for you. He did that for me. He did that for you. God, the maker of the universe, gave up his infinite power in heaven to become man and die as a criminal for you. Because he believed that each one of you has the potential to do something incredible with your life. And he desires to have each one of you in heaven for eternity with him. It doesn't matter what other people have said about you. Your, greatest, your biggest mistakes in your life, yeah, I've made them too. But God doesn't look at you that way. And he doesn't want you to stay down. He wants you to get back up because there's more to the story. When you're down, it's not over. Because even when you want to give up, God never gives up on you. He staked his life on the fact that you were worth dying for. We need to stop asking, will God love me? God's love is constant. And if you ever want to know what that love looks like, just look at a cross. That's what his love looks like, and it's never going to change. The question you should be asking is, will you let God love you? When you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror, are you willing to see yourself the way that he sees you? I understand that doesn't make confession easy. It doesn't make it easy for me to confess my sins. All that stuff I did to try and run away from the problems in my life, it hurt. And coming back to God, it felt like I was opening up that wound again to try and heal it. I remember I was, I was at a conference and I was confessing my sins to a priest who I didn't know. And, you know, I just, I just lost. I was like, Father, I've let God down. I've been committing these sins for year after year after year. I haven't changed. I've mocked his mercy. I don't deserve this. And he said to me, well, Stephen, who do you look up to? And that kind of caught me off guard. So I said, well, you know, I mean, the saints, um, St. Francis, St. Augustine, John Paul II. And he stopped me and he said, the saints are not saints because they never fell. They are saints because every time that they fell, they got back up and ran to God's mercy. The very reason they are saints is they never stopped running to Christ for mercy. Stephen, God isn't asking you to be perfect today. He isn't asking you to have everything figured out today. What he's asking you is, are you willing to let him love you just like he loved those saints you admire? That is the path to sainthood. That is the path to freedom. That is the path to true and eternal happiness. So ultimately the question is, are we gonna face the problems in our life or are we gonna run away from them? There's a, uh, I was out, I've been out to Denver a few times over my life. And there's this phenomenon that goes on in nature out there that I think relates very well to confession. It's one of the few places in the world where cows and buffalo are in the same place together. And they react very different differently to storms coming over the Rockies. When a storm comes over the Rockies, cows run away from the storm. Cows aren't very fast though. So they end up getting stuck in the storm, but they keep running. So they end up being stuck in it longer, prolonging the discomfort that they feel. Buffaloes, when they see a storm coming over the Rockies, they face it and they run straight through it. Yeah, they get wet, but they get through it a lot faster than the cows do. That's the same choice we have. We can run away from our problems. We can run away from God's mercy. But the reality is, is the further away we run, the worse the problems get, the more overwhelming it feels, the worse we feel. Or we can run into the storm going on in our life. Whatever it is, whatever sins, whatever hurt, whatever pain it is, we can face it. And it's hard, I get that, but there is an end to the storm. And Christ is there with us. He says in the Gospel of Matthew, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. 
a yoke is meant for an animal to carry. And in the Middle East during the time of Christ, it was meant for two animals to carry together. When you go into the storm, Christ is with you every step of the way. So what I ask you to do tonight, open up your heart to our Lord because he wants to set you free. He wants you to be everything that you were meant to be. The question is, is are you willing to accept it? I'm gonna end with a story. France, 1798. In the throes of the revolution, at the height of the reign of terror, many faithful Catholics were put to death for their faith. And in particular, priests were singled out. There was one man who had a strong hatred for the priesthood. By the end of the revolution, he bragged he had killed 30 by his, own, by his own hand. Fast forward many years, this man is old, frail, and on his deathbed. Unknown to him, his wife had been a Catholic in secret. So she desperately starts reaching out to every priest she knows, hoping one of them will give him a, her husband a chance for confession. Many refuse, but finally one accepts. The priest comes into the room. He announces who he is. And after all these years, the old man's hatred hadn't lessened. He looks at the priest and he says, if I could get up right now, I would cut your throat. And the priest looks at him in the eyes and he says, you already did. He pulls down his collar to reveal an old scar across his neck. The old man recognized the scar. He recognized the priest. He remembered the night that he had attacked him. And he remembered leaving him to die alone. He didn't know what to say. So the priest continued. God saved me so I could save you. That old man had been running away from the problems in his life for a long time. But that night, he chose to face his problems. He opened up his heart, confessed his sins, and died in the grace of God. Every time I think about that story, I see myself as the old man. And God is the priest. Quite frankly, we, we all are that old man one way or another. Jesus was on the cross because of our sins. But what blows me away, no matter how much I run away, no matter how much I reject him, no matter how much I try to ignore him, he refuses to give up on me. He refuses to give up on you. So what I ask you tonight, give God a chance to change your life because he never gives up on you.